Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Select Generation podcast uh, with your favorite host, Sam Henneberg. So today I'm joined uh, by a very special guest, Brian Dorn. Brian, I don't say that every time. You're a very special guest. And uh, it's, uh, it's a special episode because we're actually on opposite sides of the world from where we both grew up. So I'm currently in North Carolina. Um, I'm at a tournament this weekend, and that's very close to where Brian grew up in South Carolina. And then Brian is in England, up in Scarborough, about two, three hours from where I grew up in near London. So, yeah, going to be an interesting podcast. We'll talk about, you know, Brian going over there, playing in England, how the different style of football is, um, why he didn't go directly to college um, and, you know, some other interesting stuff. So, Brian, thank you for your time, mate. Looking forward to the pod and I'll uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you for having me, Sam. I really appreciate the time that you've given me. My name is uh, Brian Doig. I am the class of 2023, and I was a striker for Lucy Beckham High School. Nice, man. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Brian. So where you're at now, um, and then like your your soccer journey growing up. Like, Did you always play high school? Did you ever play club? Were you going to tournaments growing up? Did you always play for the same, same club, same high school? Um, you know, tell us a little bit about sort of your soccer career from when you were a little boy kicking the ball to now. So I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, near where you are currently. And um, soccer's always been huge in my life. You know, my dad, my mom, my uncle, they really always pushed me to play sports. And um, I think out of the sports that I've played, you know, a lot of American kids, they'll play basketball, football, baseball, soccer, you know, they'll play all the sports. And I, I think I really just honed in on soccer. It's something I really enjoyed and something I really actively like to participate in. I originally started out um, U5, U6, and just, you know, a simple rec league, um, playing with my friends, you know, learning the, basically the developmental and fundamental skills of how to play the game. Um, I then in my U8 team joined a coach named Chip Decker, and he was someone who was really inspirational to me in the game. He's someone who really elevated me to the next level. And that year, I won my first state championship on that team um, in the USYS League, which is the highest league in South Carolina, um, the state league. And that's way before ECNL, NPL, any of that was created. Throughout that team, that got me to higher levels within South Carolina. I used to, I joined um USA Mount Pleasant which is formerly now known as Surf South Carolina and um you know that really helped me develop my game and I was there for about I want to say three years developing on their A team and their premier team um and that really really helped me push my game to the next level uh when I was U15 I rejoined that coach Decker team and I won my second state championship And that's when I began to start playing high school soccer because in elementary and middle school here, they don't have a, you know, a developmental team that you can play on. So high school was kind of like the only, like, not really club soccer, but like league soccer that they had for school. So my first year was at Wando High School after I played with coach Chip Decker and I played with a coach named Shiloh Tisdale. And he put me on the junior varsity squad, but unfortunately that was canceled due to coronavirus for that season. And I was moved and transferred over to another school called Lucy Beckham, where I graduated at formerly at the class of 2023. And I played varsity there for three years. And um, now I'm in England uh, due to Select Generations uh, showcase and their able, ability to provide me with an opportunity to come over here and really showcase and develop my talents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a, a good career you've had so far, man. That's that's cool. I didn't know a couple of those things. But so for you, Brian, obviously going over and playing in England, that's a big step. So talk to us a little bit about um, your college process, right? So you knew after high school you wanted to either go to college or you know you have aspirations to go pro. So how how did you go about the college process did you start thinking about it your sophomore year your junior year senior year what were you doing were you emailing coaches did you have a highlight reel were you going to id camps like what what was your thought process from when you were like sophomore junior going to college like what what did you think well my recruitment process 
started in my junior year when I started creating highlight reels. And really, really when I got access to uh, a VO camera, that's when I really started being able to showcase my talents um, to different places and different people. But a lot of my recruitment began when I started going to ID camps. My first ID camp was when I was 11 and I went to the Clemson ID camp. I consider it to be the biggest and the best, one of the best ID camps in the country. You know, they have about 600, 700 kids that showcase their talents every year. Three out of four players on their roster are from their ID camps. And it really just allowed me to grow and meet new people and have new experiences. Um, through there, I started meeting people that allowed me to showcase my opportunities at smaller but um, more presentable showcases, such as your Select Generation Showcase. And that really allowed me the opportunity to meet other coaches and give them my game film, give them my highlights, and really present myself in a better and more professional way. Um, NCSA Soccer really started helping me in my junior year with uh, recruitment and talking to coaches because it allows me to get more exposure from the coaches. It allows me to email them directly and to upload my highlight tapes there. Um, it really vamped up when my senior year hit. I had over 10 offers on NCSA going into my senior year, and that really, really helped with um, getting me out there. Yeah, for sure. So when you say you went to some ID camps and, um, you know, you were kind of going and, and getting exposure that way, was that the only way you were getting exposure junior, senior year, going to ID camps? Were you emailing coaches? Were you getting any responses? Was it, you know, what, what was the difficulty for you in terms of finding a college? Um, the, difficult me, the difficulty of me finding a college really is the fact that you have to know athletically and academically what you want. Because at the end of the day, it's student athlete, not athlete student. You have to find what major you want to go into first and what you want to do with your life. Because some of these schools that offer you, they don't offer the academic programs that you want to achieve in. And, you know, that instantly scratches it off the bucket list for me. Because in my opinion, I believe that the academics take over the athletics when you're looking for a college. That's the, that should be the first thing you're worried about. Um, ac athletically, I think that, um, I don't really know how to put this. I guess that, you know, I guess I was technical enough for all of these schools, but they just, it didn't fit me either because of the way they coached, the way their program was or what they had to offer academically for me. Those would be the three main reasons why I wouldn't go to a college or why I would hinder my decision to go to that college. You know, also, for example, D, D, D3 colleges, they don't offer athletic scholarships as well. So I would get an academic scholarship on one hand, but I couldn't get the athletic scholarship on the other hand. And that also hindered my decision or ability to go to that school. Yeah, 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 for sure. I think that's really important. Like for me, I knew I wanted to go somewhere with a good business school. So that's like was a big factor in my decision of of when I was uh, choosing schools and picking schools. Um, and then just for you, Brian, like when you were when you were going to showcases, like what was different about an ID camp that you went to versus a select generation showcase that you went to? Like at the ID camps, why why did you end up getting an offer? from a select generation showcase or what was the differences between the select generation showcase and a specific school ID camp? Um, I really think I wouldn't say bias, but when you go to a college showcase rather than a select generation showcase, they already have a list of people that they're kind of looking at that they, they're saying, Oh, this person signed up. We're going to look at this person. We've already seen their film. We've already seen what they look like academically. We, we know we kind of want this person. And the other people are just kind of scratched off the list. With the select generation showcases, they're more coming out to find you rather than the other way. Um, I really think it gives students and athletes a better opportunity to participate and to show their skills in front of coaches. I also think the coaches kind of pay more attention at these showcases because it kind of 
is more mysterious as to who they're going to pick and who they're going to choose and, you know, how they really go about things. I think it's a lot more professional and I think it offers a lot more opportunity than what a college showcase would because the select generation showcases offer more opportunities in my opinion, because when you go to a college showcase, there might be multiple colleges there, but they're all offering the same thing to go to the college. Select generation offers colleges, overseas, um, semi-pro and professional, you know, they're really linked in and connected with everything in my opinion. And I think that really sets y'all showcase out from any other showcase I've been to. And I'm really appreciative of that. Yeah, Brian, Brian I'm going to have to hire you to start doing some sales speeches for me. <laughs> no, I think, I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's what we try and do, right? Like a lot of players like yourself, they, yeah, go, to, like, they go to an ID camp where it's one school and you're getting looked at one school. And, you know, they already, they've invited some players, some other players have signed up, but we, you know, we want to give like a range of schools and a range of options. And even if you come to our showcase and the coaches and they're watching, we send them the film. We say, hey, look, this player played really well. This is a player you need to look at. And, you know, like whether when you go to ID camp for a school, it doesn't really matter if they commit to that school or not, because, you know, they're, they're looking at a player. That, okay, if he's good, perfect, take him. If he's not good, all right, it doesn't matter. But for us, like if we can get every single player at our showcase committed, that helps us a lot. You know, players want to sign up to future showcases. Like we're, we're willing to put in the effort to sort of make these connections for players because you know, that that's going to help us lead to more commitments and better commitments in the future. So yeah, no, I, th I think, I think you're right there, but um, so then talk to us about SFS, right? So you're playing now at the SFS Academy over in Scarborough in England. Um, so how did that come about? Um, what was the, the process like? Did you get an offer? Were you having Zoom calls? Were you hesitant? Like, talk to us about like how it really started and then like the, the sort of um, the signing process. So I absolutely agree with what you said before. And I think that Select Generation has a, a wider spectrum of offers and it has a bigger range of things that you can get into. In early May, I believe I participated in the Charlotte, the, the first Charlotte showcase that Select Generation had, and I met Victor, um, very nice person, very class, um, very professional. And I think through that showcase, um, you know, I played really well. Uh, I scored a really, really good goal, and I really got along with all of my teammates. And it's something that I really enjoyed and was passionate about. And I think that's what pushed me to do better in that showcase. Um, I got a, a wide range of offers um, from that. I was invited to Wingate's um, International Soccer Academy's ID, ID Showcase in July, which I went to from the 16th to the 20th. I believe we talked about that. Um, I was also offered from Lees McRae and Warren Wilson Men's College. And then I got an offer that I accepted from SFS International Scholarship, and I believe was the best opportunity for me. And that really shows the spectrum of what Select Generation has to offer and what abilities they have to give to a player rather than going to a regular ID camp or sending game film out. And the thing is, Select Generation does that for you. You know, they can, as signing as one of their athletes, not as just going to their ID camps, signing as one of their athletes like I have and like Eli Curley has and like how, how many other players have done gives you so many more opportunities than just going to showcases or going through NCSA soccer because it's more personable, you know, like I feel like we really have a better connection than what I would if I went through just a website or if I just had someone different or went through somebody else or just talked to a college coach on my own because it really just gives you the opportunity to have someone to present you and kind of, you know, almost vouch for you in a sense in someone that's very professional about it. And I really think that's what the opportunity I got at SFS was when you talked to Steve Brennan about me coming over here. I think you really vouched for me and I really do appreciate that and the opportunity that I've been given. Um, SFS, you know, playing in England, is something I've wanted to do since I said I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. It's something I've always wanted to do since I was five or six years old whenever I began to play the beautiful game. And I really think that Select Generation can help these dreams become realities. Yeah, for sure.
yeah no i mean i'm glad you feel that way like for us we want to be a personal we want to have a personal relationship with you know it's not like all right brian you're over there have fun let me know when you're back and uh, i hope it went well you know we want to sort of check in with you and let us know your results and how you played and all that stuff um so yeah no, i'm glad i'm glad you feel that way um but yeah so talk to us about the onboarding process like what was your decision to to commit like how many calls did you have with steve did you have to talk to your parents about it because i know at one point you were weighing up "Ah, i don't know if i want to go abroad i want to go to college and stay in the u.s stay close to home with my dog so like what was your like deciding factors um and like why yeah how did how did it go like did he show you did he facetime you and show you the stadium what was he what was he talking to you about So when I was recommended to Steve, I had about three or four phone calls before I seriously, you know, was considering going over to the United Kingdom. And it was a long discussion with my parents. My my mom and my dad were very worried that I would be, you know, kind of timid and scared on my own and kind of just isolated from everything. And um I think it's been the complete opposite, you know, with Steve being here with the rest of the guys being here in the accommodation, I think that's really helped um, bring my confidence level up and bring my game up and coming over here was a huge decision. It was something that, you know, I, I never thought I would do. And like you said, leaving my dog was also something that was really, really hard for me and leaving my family, um, leaving all of my friends, my peers, my teammates, my old coaches, it was a really, really tough decision. But in the end, I think it benefit, benefited for me the most. And I think it's a decision that I won't regret because when I was weighing either coming over to here or coming to college, you know, like you said, um, when you were discussing with me, it's maybe an opportunity that I would never get again. It's something that, you know, I just couldn't pass up. And I started really considering committing over here in late June, early July. And I had a long discussion with my mom and my dad about it. And we decided that it would be the best decision for me. And I committed here on July 16th, 2023 to come over to SFS International. Yeah, right. No, that's awesome. So, Brian, right, been wanting to ask you this. What about the English style of football? Obviously, I grew up playing it. I miss it a lot. Um, I'm very envious of you getting to be involved in it every day. So talk to us, like, how is it different from your high school, your club football, um, you know, how, how, what's the game like in England? What, what would you say to someone that's watching this that is like, oh, I'm thinking about going over to the UK. I'm thinking about going over to Europe. I think it would be good for me to mature. The style of football is different. What advice would you, or what would you tell those players? Well, first off, I have to say it's much more different and the game is much more physical. Um, the way that players um, treat you, the way that players you know, face up to you the way that players play. It's a lot more demanding and physical than the United States. That's something you have to adjust to immediately. And if you don't, you're going to get lost. I mean, it's plain as simple as that. And I think you know that too. I think you know that it's a really tough game. I think you know that it's a really driving game and demanding. And I think that, you know, adjusting to it can be hard if you don't have the right support system around you. But if you do, then it's a lot easier to adjust to the game and you get a lot more fit a lot more quickly. And I also want to say that coming over here on that flight, you know, it's, it's an eight hour flight. You lose a lot of fitness. So right as you come here, you have to, you know, jump on it immediately. Like as soon as I got over here, I came about a week and a half before any of the other players did. And I had to do personal training sessions for about three to four days just to get back to the fitness level I was before I came over here. When I, before I left, I had about four or five training sessions with um, Oceanside Collegiate Academy, which was a state championship winning team, very respected team in South Carolina. And they were the number two team in the nation um, in max preps this high school year. They, the only team that was better than them was Brentwood, um, Tennessee team that was 25 and 0. But, you know, you lose a lot of fitness when you come over here and the game is very physically demanding. So come over here, you have to immediately be on your best game and on your best level. And if you're not, then it's game over. Yeah. And what what do you think about like the style of soccer? Obviously, it's very, it's more like physically demanding. There's a lot of second balls, like in the US, you know, club soccer, people want to try and play and 
you know, I always say in England, like every game is a must win. Like whatever it takes, is you find a way to win. So how would you describe like the style of football, the tactical aspect of football in the UK? Um, the quality of the players is much more outstanding than what you would get from ECNL, NPL, MLS next. It's so much quicker. The game moves so much quicker and you have to adjust to that as well. The quality of the passing, the quality of the dribbling, the quality of the defending, the quality of first touch, the quality of to move on and off the ball. It's much more physically demanding. It's much more technically demanding and it's instant. There's no second touch. You don't get a second chance. Basically you get, you have to get the second ball or they're going to go past you. Um, I think that it's also something that you have to adjust to very, very quickly and you have to get used to. Um, I think that the way they play the game over here is – how do I put this? It's outstandingly – the quality is outstandingly better than the United States. Like, it's just more demanding in every single aspect that I can think of. And something I told Steve today, he said, what have you found easy over here? I said, nothing. Nothing's easy over here. You have to play hard at every single moment. Because you don't get another opportunity. You you have to do what you're told. You have to do what you're told. And you have to play the game in their style because they force you to, in a sense, you know? What do you think about tactically, right? So, like, your training sessions. I imagine at high school or at club, it's pretty much like, okay, this is a pattern of play. We're going to play this way, cross finish. Like, from some of the sessions that I've watched or I've been involved in, it's... You know, it's a good level, good tactical approach, but it's it's kind of basic. So do you have like any film, any analysis sessions? I know you're still in preseason, so I'm not sure, but um, you know, what what's the what's the tactical aspect what's the tactical aspect of training like? Is it, you know, you're gonna set up defensively without the ball, are you doing set pieces, are you doing patterns of play and how to transition from the front to the back, counter attack, you know, um what what's the tactical training like? Everything is practice and everything builds up in training to a more complex point in every single time that you move throughout the training. So, you know, start with the basics and then you get more complex as the training goes. Everything builds on each other, um, especially when you're doing dribbling, passing, shooting, training. But I also think it's that way with recovery sessions. I think recovery sessions over here is something that I didn't have in the United States um, with my tactical training. And I think it's something that really helped when you go back into tactical training, because it allows you to have more energy, more agility, more quickness, more speed. And when everything builds on top of each other, for example, you know, you might just do a one, two pass at the beginning, but then it builds up into triangle passing, switching the ball, crossing it back in, laying it off to the second player, and then a shot. So everything is just tactically more sound over here in my opinion i believe that the game is played differently because of the tactics and the way that they're involved into the game the way our team moves is we like to build it up from the back and play the long ball because a lot of our strikers will like to hold the ball and they'll like to pass it off and play it wide um it's a lot different from the united states of just kind of you know, you'll see the MLS, they'll just kind of pass it around and move the ball and then they'll play it down the, you know, to the corner flag or they'll kick it down to the corner flag. This is a lot quicker in a tactical sense that it's pass, pass, move, 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 pass, pass, move, move, move. And a lot of things are based off of triangle passing um, through the defense, through the midfield, through what the strike. Would, what, what would you say also about like the vocals, right? Because I always... When I came my freshman year, I was screaming for every ball, screaming for the ball, get up, defense, you know, press, get him into a corner, don't let him switch the ball. Like I thought in England, I thought I was quiet. I thought I wasn't talking enough. And then I came to the US and I was screaming, shouting, like, uh, you know, obviously positive, but more tactical, like don't let him switch the field. Or like, I feel like in the US, it's not ingrained when you're growing up to communicate that much. Obviously it's important. Tell your man he's got time, tell him man on tell them to turn, tell them to shoot. But I feel like in the UK, there's so much more vocal communication. Do you, Have you learned any of that? I absolutely agree with that, 
everything here, the players, the opposition, even the fans in a sense are way louder than they will ever be in the United States. And I also think it has to do with the passion of the game. I really think that it has to deal with these players over here. This is their livelihood. You know, the United States, it may just seem like a game, but players play over here like it's their lives. And it is. And everything is more vocally communicated than it is in the United States. And that's a, definitely an adjustment that I've had to make. In the United States, I felt like I was being loud. And when I came over here, it was like the opposite of you. I felt like I was being quiet. You know, I felt like I was, you know, the, the softest speaking player on the pitch. People scream over here for the ball. They want the ball so badly because they're so passionate about it. And, you know, that really amps me and excites me to get into the regular season and get going and get into the flow of things again. For sure. Uh, how have the how have the lads been? How have the, your teammates been? They've been welcoming. Have they? Yeah, we you? have um, we have six um, internationals from the United States, one from uh, Canada, and one from France. So it's definitely a mix. It's a melting pot for sure. Um, but everyone's enjoying the accommodation. We love it here. Um, we are <laughs> we have our own kitchen that we've been cooking in, and that's been uh, really cool. To kind of learn how to cook with all of the lads. Uh, it's definitely been a, a new experience and something I've been enjoying getting used to. Um, but also I've learned something about the communication here with um, you can't say leave it. You yeah. can't say you have to say your name, which is very odd to me. Um, yeah. It's definitely something I'm still getting used to um, and something that will take time to get used to for sure. Yeah, you, you can't say PK it has to be a pen. You can't say, sir, yeah. has to be referee. I gotta, I gotta yellow in one of the games for that for what like, I, saying pk i was like <laughs> it was um it was it was a memorable experience for sure but there like i've said in the beginning of the podcast there are certain phrases and things that i'm still yeah. getting used to and accommodated to yeah what 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 slang have you picked up like what well also how, how's the cultural difference how is it living in england massive absolutely massive it's uh you know, the food, the clothes, the transportation, the, um, you know, the accommodation, everything has somewhat similar but different names. And it takes a little while to get used to, like, like train is trolley and fries or chips. Like there's just, <laughs> it's just little tiny things, but they all add up at the end of the day. Um, the money is definitely something I've had to get used to. The tax. Um, American dollars to British pounds is definitely something that is uh, and the, the tax is included, so you don't have to worry. Yeah, the markup fee is uh, it's it stinks. That's for sure because <laughs> a, a one fifty three. I I just went to the um to the Barclays Bank today to transfer money, and one pound is a dollar fifty three now. Yeah. So it's um it's exponentially growing by the day. Um, and it'll, it'll always be that way, but it's definitely something that is uh, a little more difficult than that I've had to get used to. Yeah. What do you, what do you miss from, from home? Other, other than like your family and your dog, what do you miss? Food. <laughs> the food for sure. Um, you know, growing up in Charleston, we had, um, a lot of, a lot of different seafoods from where Scarborough is. And obviously the similarities of being on the coast, being next to a beach, um, you know, the weather is also something I've really missed. It, it's nice weather over here um, compared yeah, wait, to Charles. Wait, 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 wait a couple of months and see if you're still saying that. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it was raining today. It was definitely cold. But um, the weather is definitely another huge adjustment that I've had to get used to. Um, also, not being able to drive is definitely something that has uh, been interesting. I've had to walk everywhere here and unless Steve picks me up and um, – you know, when he does pick me up, being on the left side of the road is also very, very interesting. It kind of scares and the, me. And the roundabouts? Yeah, they're two lanes instead of one. It's um, <laughs> it's very, very different over here. The the roads and just being able to transport in general. I've been thinking about investing in a bike almost. You, in should, a sense you should get a bicycle, yeah. Uh, it's definitely a faster way of traveling and um, getting to the stadium would be a lot easier from uh, the accommodation. Yeah, yeah. Um... No, that's good, bro. So just lastly, like what piece of advice would you give to someone that is number one, that's debating, like starting the co college process, like say their junior year, they're starting the college process. What advice would you give to them to go to college or go to international? And then what advice would you give to someone that's thinking, 
about going to Europe that's a bit hesitant, like, oh, I'm not sure if I should do it. I'm not sure if it's worth the, uh, you know, leaving home and trying a new style of soccer when I can just go to college. And, you know, like, I know it's safe. I know it, it can happen. Like, what advice would you give to someone junior year starting the college process? And what advice would you give to someone senior year who's got the opportunity to go to Europe but is hesitant? Um, junior year, I would recommend, honestly, putting yourself out there and getting as much exposure as possible. Um, if you're thinking about coming over to Europe, it's definitely something that you need to plan in advance. Um, it's definitely something that you need to be ready for when you when you come over here. And I think that, you know, when you're when you're a junior and also when you're a senior, but more when you're a junior, again, it's student athlete, not athlete student. I think you really need to start honing in and focusing on what major you kind of want to pick and what route you kind of want to take with your life. In senior year, um, if you if you get the opportunity to come over to Europe, you know, it's a maybe an opportunity that you'll never get again. It's maybe something that you'll never be able to experience if you do go the college route. And, you know, if, if you do go the college route, I, I very much respect it. And I have the, the best wishes for anyone that takes that route. But going to Europe is just it's it's very different. It's very vast. And it's a it's a very culturally different experience that you may not be able to get again if you go the college route, because you'll be there for those four years and you'll think, man, why didn't I go to England or man, I should have took that opportunity because when I come back from England, I will still have all four years of my eligibility for college. I will still be able to go to whatever college I would like to. But I think that having this opportunity from SFS International Scholarship has made me realize that this is the best route that I could have taken and that many other student athletes should take before they go into college and it'll develop them greatly. Yeah, for sure. Brian, I think that's a, I think that's a great podcast, man. Maybe one of the best we've done. I think you spoke from the heart. <laughs> right here, for, play for the badge. Yeah, man, love that. I've, I hear you've been going to the ultras and going to the, the the York or the Scarborough games? Yeah, there's one tomorrow at 3 p.m. I'm not sure who they played, but they played um, Chester, Chester FC last weekend. They have another late win, 1-0 in the 93rd minute off a free kick. Nice. And, awesome. um, you know, the, the games over here are so much more passionate. The the fans are so much more into the game than really at any sporting event into the United States, because in the United States, they'll see, you know, they'll, they'll have like loudspeakers and they'll have like a, like an overhead, you know, music player and video player. They just make their own chance over here out of nothing. They'll make it out of thin air. You know, they have so much passion and enthusiasm about their players. And one thing I do love about this club is that's owned by the fans. You know, that's that's something you don't get with a lot of clubs, you know, especially in the higher leagues in um, the United Kingdom. And I, I think it's really special that I'm here and I'm really appreciate and glad um, to God and my teammates and my peers and my coaches and especially Select Generation for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, for sure. Now, Brian, we're we're we know you're going to do good. I mean, I'm excited for you going into the season. Um, I think you're a great lad, obviously good on the field. So now we're buzzing for you, mate. And um. Yeah, all the best for your next uh, next training sessions and your next game. Thanks for the time on the podcast, Brian, all right? Yeah, thank you for your time, Sam. I really appreciate it, and uh, have a wonderful night. You too, mate. Bye-bye.